for the program Coming Home. We began by meeting at uh, a hotel in the ballroom, and from there we, we uh, came upon a property that we are currently at today. And, and, and I get on them all the time. We have to change our thinking if we're ever going to walk in the kingdom of God. Well, welcome to the second half of our program this evening, and uh, our, our special guest in the second half of the program has actually been on the Coming Home program before, and that was March 7th of this year, and this is Pastor Dan Driscoll from the Evangelical Free Church of Old Wine, and so please welcome him with me. Pastor Dan, it's good to have you back on the program again, and um, it's, it's, it's been a, a great delight for me to have the privilege of meeting and getting to know some very wonderful pastors. And so the purpose of our program is to introduce you, the viewer, to local churches and local pastors. And if you happen to be one of those people that is looking for a church home, you're not attending church, but you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're trying to figure out what church God wants to plant you in, listen, if you're anywhere near the city of Old Wine, uh, I would encourage you as you listen to Pastor Dan in the interview time and then as he ministers just listen to what he has to say listen to his heart and just make a date to go visit them there at their church in old wine so pastor dan what has god been doing in your church in the last five months or so well much what he's been doing all along i guess the the uh, we have several continuing ministries and yes one of the one of the most exciting for me is is the i the we call it, it's called Celebrate Recovery, and it's a, a um, ministry to people who are addicts or alcoholics, and hurts, hang-ups, and habits, and uh, we've just been watching God rebuild lives, and that's, that's exciting to see as, as uh, these men and women come to us, and they are, just, their lives are broken. And, of course, their prayer is at first, you know, well, God, would you rebuild my life? Well, and I'd like that done this afternoon. Yes. Uh, but God gives them a pile of bricks and says, here we go. And gives them a direction book, the Bible, and, and a group of people that will help them. And, and it's just fun to watch. It's Sometimes the slope, the, the recovery slope is very, very steep. But it is fun to watch these guys grab hold of, of truth and apply it and claim it and, and see God respond to them. So the Celebrate Recovery is, is always, uh, uh, it's always kind of a, a uplift to me. Uh, of course, our Awana program has been on hold for the summer. We have Awana for kids, and that's always high energy and lots, yes. of, lots of noise and and lots of uh, enthusiasm and lots of kids running in the hallways. Awana has, you know, when I was a kid, church and fun never went together. We, that, that was just not part of what church was. And Awana is fun. And it's also very biblically based. I mean, these kids are learning Bible verses. And, and the goal of Awana is to win children, boys and girls to Christ and train them to serve him. And yes. so uh, that's, that, that's a significant ministry and, and it's a significant ministry within our church body. We, yes. we really focus there. So those two things, we have small groups and we have a, we have a, uh, a program. We have one student who has uh, taken a bachelor's degree in, in uh, biblical leadership from us, and that, that, that again, that's, uh, uh, that's an exciting thing. I'd like to see more of that, but it's, it's a very demanding kind of uh, curriculum, and so it's, that's tough work. But building leaders for the future generations of the church is, if we don't do that, we're going to be in serious trouble. So it's a very significant ministry. And in that one, we're, we're kind of networking together with some other churches. We have a Baptist church and a Bible church and ourselves that are, uh, we come at things a little differently, but we, uh, we share a common faith in Christ and a common commitment to the Bible as the Word of God. And, and so, you know, we can work around stuff that we might otherwise fight about <laughs> and we're not there to fight. And so we're trying to work together and, and uh, to build a, 
uh, a program, I don't know if program is the right word, but a, a network of, of people that can help to develop leaders within the churches. And I, I think that's a significant thing. It's long term. Yes. It's not the kind of thing that you see happen just pop overnight. But Yes. And all these ministries that your church offers, Pastor Dan, it, uh, it's not just... just much more than what you can handle yourself. So you, you have a congregation of people that gets very involved with you in the doing of the Awanas program, the small groups, the children's and youth ministry and so forth. And so, you know, many people that um, are watching television, maybe that don't attend church, just think, well, I'm just looking for a church to attend. But the other thing that God wants besides people attending the church is to become an active part of a mm -hmm. church and get involved. And every pastor is just waiting for a their, one of their people to come up to him and say, Pastor, what do you have for me to do? Yeah. You ever have that happen? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We actually, I've counted cars on, on uh, Wednesday nights at Awana, and sometimes we've had as many adults there as we've had kids. I mean, it just, it, it is a, we really emphasize Awana, and, and it is a significant part of our ministry, yes. and it's, it's, a, it's a good way to uh, kind of get your feet wet in ministry, you can come in and basically be a listener to verses. You know, it's not like you have to be some great theologian or yes. know all this stuff in order to do it. You can sit down with a kid and help them to memorize a verse. And, yes. and, uh, and it's a good way to start ministry, to get started in ministry. And I, like you say, uh, God wants us to be involved in, in giving our faith away, not just taking Absolutely. it in. Absolutely. And you and your wife, Susan, have been there at that church for how many years, Pastor Dan? Uh, since 2003, so I guess that's 10. Yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Yep. You've seen a lot of things, good things happen during that time. And, um, you know, it takes, it takes a body of people, though, to, to make church life happen, doesn't it? And it, what you're talking about is about impacting uh, and reaching this generation yeah. because uh, the world needs Jesus and we're the only Jesus that many of them will see. So it's bringing people into the maturity of the faith and to where they are a reflection of Christ himself, living his life through them. And so anyway, just in closing this segment of the program, uh, Pastor Dan, any th other comments you'd like to make? Well, we have some tremendous leaders in our church, and for that yes, I'm very, very grateful. And those men are committed to us not doing it the way that we've always done it, but doing it the way that God wants it done. Amen. And that, that has been such a uh, refreshing thing for me. Uh, things that I could never get done, together we can do. Amen. And that's exciting. So That's the body of Christ being the body of Christ. And so stay tuned as Pastor Dan brings to you an inspirational message that I believe is going to touch your heart and make Jesus more real to you and, and help you to understand what it really means to be a Christian and to live the life that he's prepared for us. Thank you. Well, as we look at this, I, I think I would like to start by praying before we open the Word and just take a look at what Paul writes to his uh, assistant Timothy. So Father, we just would lift this to you and ask that the uh, explanation of your word would cause us to understand and that it would change us, Father, that we might respond to you in a way that pleases you and does us good. So we commit this to you in, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that is really, I think, important for us as Christians to understand is the role of good works in a Christian's life. Many people get confused about that. If you talk to them and you ask them, you know, the old questions that I was trained to ask were, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? And, and people will say, well, I hope so. And Well, if... You did die tonight, and God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell them? And many of them will say, well, I've tried to, I've tried to be good. I've tried to do the good works that, that I should in order to be God's person or to become God's person. And 
and I, would, I just would say to you that that's starting at the wrong end of the, the post. It, uh, God has told us very, very plainly that he wants us to trust him to give us salvation, not that we should earn it. I, I was talking to some men in a jail. One of the ministries we have is I go up to the county jail and I speak to the men and, and we were talking about different religions. And from my admittedly meager study of religions, it seems to me that every religion that I've looked at besides Christianity says, well, you must do something in order to be accepted by God. And Christianity says just kind of the opposite of that. Because you are accepted by God, you may do something. And so it's important for us to get that idea that we are, the theological term is justified by faith. Uh, that we are justified by God's grace and not by our own works. But then what do we do with works when when we are beyond that idea of salvation. What do we do then? So what shall we do? And so I would just like to share with you this passage out of Titus. It's a little book in the back of the New Testament that Paul wrote to a, a, an assistant of his who he had left in Crete to set the churches in order. And he says, The grace of God has been revealed. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave us life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, to make us His very own people totally committed to doing good works. Then Paul says to Titus, he says, you must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone disregard what you say. This is a very important idea, and it is central to how we respond to God and to the salvation that is so critical to who we are. And I, I think... The first thing I'd like you to notice here, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that and look it up. But it says, for the grace of God has appeared. The grace of God is God's generosity. God has generous, generously given to us who are sinners. He has given to us salvation. Instead of us trying to earn salvation, he has given it to us. And, and he has given us this great call to turn away from sin and to turn to a, a lifestyle that glorifies him and does us good. That's what he says, we should live in this or evil world, we turn, instruct us to turn away from godless living and sinful pleasures and live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. So there's both something you turn away from and something you turn to. And not only that, but then we are to live with, with this blessed hope uh, is how my Bible translates it. Uh, this glorious expectation of what God is going to do when Jesus Christ returns and establishes His kingdom, when He reveals, when when He is revealed in all His glory. I think it's interesting to note here, just uh, for for your uh, information, that Paul calls Jesus our great God and Savior. Paul saw Jesus, this man, this Jewish leader, he saw him as God himself. He, he attributes to Jesus the name of Jehovah in the Old Testament. This person, Jesus, is not just a guru or some religious leader. He is God Almighty. And in His coming, when He comes again, will be a glorious revelation of what we're going to share. We were talking this morning just about what glory it will be to walk on streets of gold and to, to uh, see the tree of life and the, the healing that, 
that will come to the nations and there'll be no more sorrow and no more tears, no more pain. All the things that if we could build the world, we would put into it. God says that's coming. And Jesus, this one who came, he showed that he could heal people. He showed that he could raise the dead, that he could comfort people, that he, that he was the power over all creation. He was stronger than any demon. He had all that authority. He didn't use it for everybody there, but he showed that he could, and someday he will. And so that great hope that we have, that, that great motivation that we have to continue on, is that someday God is going to come, and he is going to set things right. And we have that confidence in his word. So the salvation that God's generosity gives to us teaches us first of all to turn away from sin and to turn to righteousness and wisdom and then it gives us this great hope that we will someday realize all the blessings and all the glory that God has intended for us and then he talks about what it costs God to give us that and that is simply this he says he gave his life, that's Jesus, gave his life to free us, to redeem us, my Bible translated, from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good works. So Jesus came and redeemed us. He bought us out of the sin. We were captives to sin. We were slaves to sin. We were not our own. And Jesus came and paid the price so that we might be free to respond to God. That price, of course, was his life, his blood, the, the violent death that he endured, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood, his death on the cross for our sins. He redeemed us from Satan's grasp by his death. And he did that with a purpose. His purpose is to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good works. To make us his very own people. He cleanses us. He, he, he sets us right with him so that we are holy, so that we are no longer stained with, with the sin and the rebellion and the destructive tendencies of our own heart. But that heart has been totally renewed and he is set right with God. And He has set us in this position that we will, we will not be hiding in shame as Adam hid in shame in the garden, but rather we'll be able to come to God with confidence. He cleanses us and then He makes us His very own people, a peculiar people. We are God's own possession. He, he bought us and He owns us. Together He brings us to be his children in his great family. We were talking this morning in another group that I was in about every dad wants his family to know all the good things that the dad has to give for him, to them. And our Heavenly Father is no different from that. He has blessings planned for us not only as individuals, but as communities of faith, as church, of churches. He has blessings planned for us. He wants us to experience all these good things, all these uh, great and glorious gifts that he has set up for us. He has done that because he loves us. Just as a father loves his children, God loves us. And, and he wants us to be his family. He wants us to be that very own possession of his. And I find it great comfort. I find it great strength. I find it great joy to know that my Heavenly Father loves me and has a plan for me and has included me in his plans. He's written me into his story. And so God not only cleanses us, but he claims us as his people. And he wants us to be zealous for good deeds. Now I started off talking about how we need to be sure 
where good deeds fit into this formula of salvation. I don't do good deeds to become God's child. I do good deeds because I am God's child. And that's an important, important kind of concept that we must grasp. And if you're a parent, you think about that. You pick up that child, and as I say to young men who are just coming, becoming fathers, I tell them, I say, when you pick up that child, you're never going to be the same. And there, I think it, it'd have to be an awfully hard heart that could pick up that child and, and, and be the same, not care. When you pick up that child, he, you make a contact, a, a connection with that child. And you are enraptured with that child. And it doesn't matter if that child does what you want him to do or not. He's still your child. And he always will be. And my friends, we don't become God's children by doing what he wants. Rather, he asks us to do what he wants because we are his children. And because he loves us. And so, he wants us to be zealous for good deeds. He wants us to be totally committed, this Bible says, to doing good. And so the question that, that I have asked is, what in the world is a good work, a good deed? And I think I've come up with three criteria for that right now. The three most important criteria. First of all, I think it needs to advance the kingdom of God. I, th I think it needs to advance the cause of the kingdom. We were talking about uh, people who hang from street poles and, and, and shout the gospel out in street preaching. And their desire is to advance the kingdom of God. And that's one criteria. But I think as well that another criteria for a good deed is it needs to help the people you're trying to help. I saw the other day that Bono said that, that uh, the aid that's been given to Africa over the years, Western nations have given billions of dollars in a, of aid to Africa. And the net result of that is that the poverty level has gone up in Africa. It hasn't helped. And so we need to do those things which actually help people. We need to do those things which advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and help people. And if that guy's hanging from a street corner and, and people are looking at him like he's really weird because he does that and they're not listening to the message, he's not advancing the kingdom. He's not helping them. And so those two criteria are, go kind of hand in hand. It, God's will for us is to bring him glory and to do us good. And those things, we kind of think that those things are contradictory, but they're, they're the same. So, a good deed will be that which advances the cause of the gospel and helps people that you're trying to help instead of hurting them. And lastly, I think you have to ask what your motive is in that. 1 Corinthians 13 says that if I give my body to be burnt and have not love, it profits me nothing. And so, those three criteria, I think, are a good working definition of what it means to, to do a good work. It advances the cause of the gospel. It helps the people that you're trying to help. And you do it out of the proper motive, out of a motive of sacrifice and love, not out of a motive of, well, I'll look pretty good if I get that done. And so Paul tells Titus then, you know, say these things, teach these things. Encourage people to do good works. Correct them when they do them wrongly. And don't let anybody disregard this. Because this is absolutely crucial to what it means to be a Christian. We must be people of faith. We must be people of love. We must be people who realize that our standing with God is based upon His grace and not our merit. And yet, we are to reflect His character in our daily life doing good deeds and those good deeds of course need to be advancing the kingdom of God 
helping those who need help and not hurting them, and lastly, done out of a motive of love. So that's my encouragement to you today. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you know, He died for your sins, and He is ready to give you eternal life. And He is ready to give you a life that has significance, a life that you can fill with works which will honor Him, do you good, and help others. So with that, I'd just like to close and ask you to consider asking God to make you zealous for good deeds, to make you faithful, to believe His promises of eternal life and to trust Him to give you the insight to actually help others. And with that, I'd like to pray, if I could. Father, we just lift this to you. We ask that you might make of us people who are zealous for good works, people who understand that our salvation is a gift from you, and people who understand how they are to behave in this world in such a way that it advances your kingdom and does others good. We just ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.